Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our online quantum chaos seminar. Thank you for attending. We have a very nice turnout today. Um, uh, and so we're, we're very excited about the talk, so we'll move to that uh, in just a minute. Um, you know, before we do that, I'll just remind everyone that uh, you, you can and you should ask questions and you, you can also do it, um, you know, during the talk if you want, uh, using the live chat and, you know, we will transfer the question to the speakers. Uh, there is a, a bit of a, of a delay uh, between the YouTube and, and the Zoom, uh, so, you know, don't wait until the, until the very end to ask those questions. And I also point your attention to the links in the description of the video for you know looking at the website with the schedule and if you want to subscribe to um, to get information uh, you know and updates about the upcoming talks, uh, you can do it in those uh, links. And um, all right, so today, as you know, uh, we're very happy to have Professor, Professor Brian Swingle from the University of Maryland uh, giving this online seminar. Uh, Brian got his PhD from MIT, uh, and then he was a postdoc in uh, Harvard and in Stanford, and before he joined UMD as a faculty member. Um, his uh, work revolved around the interface between condensed matter physics, quantum information science, uh, gravity, and holography, and I believe today he's going to tell us about uh, his uh, cool work on quantum information scrambling. And uh, as I was saying, we're really happy, very excited to, uh, to have you here, Brian. Thank you for joining us in this space. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to your talk. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you for all out there for coming to watch. Hope you're doing OK during these um, somewhat chaotic and crazy times. And yeah, today I want to tell you um, a little story about um, the motion of quantum information in, in chaotic systems. And the sort of the backstory here is that, as I'll discuss shortly, there are, there are sort of many perspectives on what quantum chaos is, but relatively recently, quantum information has been adding to our understanding of the subject, giving us new perspectives on it. And so what I'll tell you about today is just posing a sort of simple question about measuring the speed of information in chaotic systems and, and show how to answer that question, at, at least to conjecture a, an answer that seems quite universal across a wide variety of physical systems. So here's the, oh, I should also thank uh, my many funders here who have supported this work, especially from Qubit and Department of Energy have, have uh, supported a lot of the students' work here, which I'll tell you about. So yeah, here's the plan. I'm gonna very briefly remind you about information spreading and chaos. Um, this will be super, super quick. And then I'm going to essentially discuss two kind of classes of results, two sets of results. One is about um, the speed of information spreading. So I'll define a precise physical setup where we can measure the spread of initially localized information. And it, it turns out that information will spread ballistically in an appropriate sense. And we want to calculate that speed or relate that speed to other physical observables of the system. And we'll succeed in doing that, at least in a simple context. And then we'll check that that, that formula that we kind of derive uh, using a quantum information argument holds both in spin chains and in holographic quantum field theories. So that's sort of like the uh, intermediate value theorem we apply then everything is in between either a spin chain or a holographic CFT and craziness. And so this result probably applies to most kinds of reasonable chaotic systems that you might be thinking about. And then the second set of results will be about some puzzles that arise when thinking more about the first set of things and um, some calculations we've done uh, at front of temperature in spin chains and field theories. Okay, so the first set of results about information spreading is going to be based primarily on this work, uh, 1908-06993 with, with Josiah, Stefan, Fook, and Shenglong. So Josiah and Stefan are uh, PhD students or just graduated PhD students from UT Austin. Fook is a postdoc in New York. Um, and Shenglong is a former postdoc of mine who's now junior faculty at Texas A&M. And then the second set of works will be based on this recent paper from just a few weeks ago with my student at Maryland, uh, Shubhai and Sahu. 
So, and again, as uh, was mentioned, please ask questions if you have them. Um, um, my motivation is to think about chaos broadly. And in particular, we know, as was pointed out last time, I think very nicely, you know, we know that there are many different ways of characterizing quantum chaos. One of the most classic, of course, being spectral properties of energy levels. But there are also a great deal of work on echoes, out of time work correlators, eigenstate thermalization, and so forth. So there's sort of a rich tapestry of different properties that you can appeal to. Um, for me, what I find extremely interesting is going back to this idea that classical chaos is sort of like deterministic randomness. The idea that quantum chaos should be viewed as some sort of um, procedure by which quantum information is sort of pseudo randomized. Now, we have to be a little careful here because we know very well that quantum uh, systems already produce randomness straightforwardly. You just measure a Z state and an X basis and you get a random outcome. But this randomness that will be produced by quantum chaos is sort of a stronger kind of randomness. It, you know, it, it may take, a, say, two state that you can initially distinguish easily with a simple measurement. And after you run them with some chaotic evolution, then at late time, you can't distinguish them at all with any simple measurement whatsoever. And that's kind of the essence of information scrambling. So we're sort of viewing chaos as a, as a scrambler, essentially. A chaotic system is a scrambler, roughly speaking. And this is interesting because it opens up a new set of tools and, and, and questions that we can ask that can shed light on the physics of chaos in, in various contexts. And here, what I'll do is ask and at least partially answer um, a relatively simple question, which is just how fast can information spread in a chaotic system? And I'll define what I mean by that precisely uh, very shortly. And um, one sort of nice feature that comes out of this is that it, it turns out this question kind of unifies various speeds that have appeared in the literature over the years. So for example, the butterfly speed, which you may be familiar with from the study of out of time order correlators, the entanglement speed, which you may be familiar with from the study of entanglement growth and thermalization. These speeds will both enter in a nice way in this information question. And so we'll get a kind of quantity at the end of the day, which actually draws on all these different speeds to give you the final information velocity. Okay, so that's the motivation. And uh, let me just jump into the physics. So what, what do I mean by information spreading? Let's start with a sort of simpler communication protocol. So if, if I wanna to talk to you using a physical system, what do I do? Well, what I do is in some region A, say, here, I excite some kind of excitation or wave or something. When I let the system evolve in time for a while, that wave perhaps, you know, I've arranged it so that it will propagate over to you here in system B. And then in system B, you make a measurement of some type, which is supposed to distinguish, you know, whether I sent a wave of type zero or type one. And if I've done this right, if my goal is to communicate, then you should be able to tell um, what kind of wave I sent with high probability. And in this way, we can send one bit using a physical system. Now, an easy calculation uh, that you can do is to, to ask what is the conditional probability that the observer in B measures that the bit you tried to send was value little b, given that you tried to send little a from region big A. And you could subtract this from, the, from this, the case where you didn't do anything in A. That's like the baseline case. And uh, a little calculation will show you that if you apply either x0, x1 to produce your excitation, then the region B measures y0 or y1, which are a complete measurement, then the outcome is that this difference of probabilities is, is, is related to a commutator between your operator that you applied to make the excitation and the time evolved Heisenberg operator of the measurement. So in other words, long story short, communication is, is controlled by commutators. And this is not, of course, a surprising thing. We know very well, for example, linear response, when you ping the system, the response at some later time is related to a commutator and, and just sort of primitive form of communication or signaling. And so when you send an electromagnetic wave, this is, you know, in, in essence, very abstractly what you're doing. Now, that's nice, um, and in 
models where you have nearly free particles or waves like the electromagnetic field, um, this is straightforward to do. And the commutator turns out to be related to like a free particle propagator, which can be large at late time. So you can make this signal, the difference in probabilities large. Um, this is what enters into say the channel capacity formula for the communication channel. And so if this is large, then the capacity can be large and you can send information. However, in an interacting strongly chaotic system, um, you can certainly inject energy locally or do various local perturbations, but typically what you'll find is that commutators decay rapidly in time. In essence, distant observers will only see noise. The reason being that chaotic systems, one of their properties is that they kind of forget where they came from. They lose memory of the initial state. And so going back to the linear response intuition, this is saying that this has to be zero if you kind of forgot where you came from. Otherwise you should be able to tell by measuring the response what you did originally. So we would expect in this kind of strongly interacting chaotic system that this difference of probability is a zero. And so this simple way of sending information is just not gonna work. The observer in B won't be able to tell what you did. They won't be able to tell what you did or tell that you did anything at all. So, um, so information is not sort of moving coherently in the usual sense in these sort of systems. Nevertheless, uh, the dynamics is unitary. So information is preserved in a, in a precise sense. And um, there is a way to access sort of the link scale or the size of region over which information has spread over some amount of time. So the idea would be, again, like think about you have a, 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 a long spin chain, say, you inject some information locally, like you pick a spin, which is either up or down that you set. And then you evolve the system in time for a while and you wanna ask, well, where is this information contained um, after some time t? Clearly it's very far away, knows nothing about the information because it just hasn't had time to propagate there thanks to the finite speed of light, for example. But you know, locally, at least the information has spread in some sense. It may not be an easily accessible sense that it's spread because these simple commutators are zero, but it has nevertheless spread in some sense. And so a, a, a very nice way to set that up is to imagine the following thought experiment. You take, say, your spin chain here. You take a reference qubit, which I've called R, and at time zero, you maximally entangle that reference qubit with, say, the center site, the zero site of your spin chain. So then you put the reference qubit away in a box, nothing happens to it. And the system, the spin chain evolves in time for some time. T. And then you wanna ask the question, well, how big a region do I need access to in the spin chain to fully recover the entanglements between the spin chain and the reference? So at time zero, I only need the first site. And we know for any time, the whole system is sufficient because I can just reverse the unitary transformation that did time evolution and thereby recover the entanglement. But those are the two extreme cases. So in general, there'll be some intermediate scale, some intermediate size region, which if you had complete access and control over, that is like you could run arbitrary quantum computations for arbitrary amount of time, you could recover the entanglement with the reference from just that region and nothing else even though this region is highly entangled with the rest of the system, et cetera. And uh, what we're gonna find is we're gonna, so our question is gonna be how this region grows with time. And my claim is, is that this region for a variety of sort of standard chaotic systems, this region size will grow linearly with time, ballistically. And this will define a velocity V sub I, which I call the information velocity. So I emphasize again, just before I go on that it's not that this information or entanglement is like accessible locally. It's not that it's on any particular bit. It's encoded in some very complicated pseudo random way in this big region, the big purple region. But nevertheless, if I have access to this whole region and I can run arbitrary computations, then I can recover it. In terms of computing quantities, what you can do is calculate the mutual information between the reference R and subregions of the chain of varying size. And once the mutual information is close to two, which is its maximal value in this case, then you know that that information is definitely contained in that purple region. Okay, and that's what we're actually gonna calculate. 
it, it is indeed the case that as far as we know, the decoding is extremely hard. So it's not easy to read out the entanglement or to, to distill it in a simple form. Okay, so with that setting, let me explain to you our main result. So we consider a class of states that are, um, they're not necessarily in equilibrium. They have some energy density epsilon, which you should think of as setting like a temperature scale or some just setting the energy density. They have what we call entanglement fraction F, which means the entanglement entropy of a region A is a fraction F at time zero of its maximal value. So if you start with a product state, then F is zero because there's no entanglement. If for some reason you started in a maximally entangled state already, then F would be one because you're already at sort of the maximal entanglement you can have. And you can arrange for intermediate um, entanglement fractions in various ways. Uh, for example, you could start with a state of some energy density, let it thermalize for a while so you generate lots of entanglement. So then the local entropy will look like a thermal entropy of the appropriate thermal state at that temperature. Then you can quench the system by adding more energy locally uniformly throughout the whole system, but doing it in a way that doesn't add any extra entanglement. So now the new final equilibrium state will have higher entanglement ultimately at long time because you've increased the energy density. But the initial entanglement is appropriate for the state of the lower energy. And so this fraction will be related to the ratio of entropy densities. But in any event, we can consider this class of states. Um, and we're going to have a kind of quantum information model, which will help us understand the result and derive it, which in which we take the entanglement entropy of this region A to be simply the minimum of its initial value, which is the fraction F of its equilibrium situation, which is the entropy density S times the volume, plus a growing term, the entropy density times this quantity V sub E, which depends on the fraction F times the area times time. So this first term is just the growing entropy of the region with time. We just assume essentially that it starts at some initial value related to the fraction F and then it grows linearly with time proportional to the boundary until once it equals just S times A, the total possible entropy, it saturates exactly. So this is obviously a caricature of what actually happens in a physical system. There'll be some rounding effects as you approach the final value, et cetera. But it turns out that it, as long as these don't um, extend over a long time scale in the, in the dynamics, then they don't affect the final result very much. I should emphasize though, this is kind of true. This is only really true for quasi 1D. So either like intervals in 1D or strips in higher dimension. If you consider spheres or other kinds of geometries, the story is a little bit more complicated. But that is this formula is not even sort of qualitatively accurate. Um, our methods will extend to that case too, but I won't talk about them here. Okay, so I'm just going to focus on this quasi 1D situation. So in any event, long story short, you have this entanglement fraction F, which defines your initial condition, and you have the entanglement velocity V sub E, which tells you essentially how fast the entanglement grows. The other velocity that you have is the velocity of V sub B, the butterfly velocity, which controls operator spread. So this is something that you would measure from an out of time order correlator. I will define what these are a little bit later in the talk. It's not essential that we see a formula for them right now. So I'm not gonna bother with that, but you'll see a formula later. Um, but just think about this is, this is how fast, you know, if I like, make a Heisenberg operator and I look at how much it's spread in space, this VB is related to that speed. So then our result is the following. The information velocity VI I defined here, which is how this region over which the entanglement has spread grows with time. That's simply given by the minimum of VE divided by one minus F and VB. So whichever of those two things is smaller, it depends on F. So the information velocity depends on how much entanglement you have initially. And you get this simple formula. In fact, in many cases, we can argue that this VE over one minus F is always smaller than or equal to VB. So um, what we expect is that you just get the first term. And um, when F is equal to zero, you get the VE of zero. When F approaches one, it turns out this first term here approaches VB. So it just, it just uh, 
asymptotes between VE and VB um, as you change this entanglement fraction. Okay, and this is our main, this is our main result in this paper. And um, the argument that, as I said, what, what we're gonna do is give a kind of quantum information argument and then also show you some, some sort of data, if you like, numerical data, calculational data on spin chains and holographic models that all support this being the right answer. Okay, so let me give you an example, um, which I'll try to go through sort of slowly so we get the hang of the reasoning which is the case of F equals to one. So that's when you start with a fully entangled pure state originally. So in other words, imagine you have uh, some state in the middle of the spectrum and you evolve it in time for a long time. So it's very highly entangled. It looks locally like a maximally mixed state. It's totally thermalized. Now let's take this single zero qubit in the center out and replace it with something which is maximally entangled with the reference. That's something we can definitely do. So this is the state at time zero now. You have this otherwise very highly entangled state and then the center qubit is entangled with the reference. And now we evolve in time and we ask, okay, how far is this entanglement spread over the rest of the system as I discussed? And um, one thing you can say is to, to the extent that, that the butterfly speed is sort of like an upper speed limit on the rate at which anything can go, you would expect this spreading can't possibly happen faster than the butterfly speed. So you expect the information speed to be less than or equal to the butterfly speed for sure. But what I claim is it's actually equal to the butterfly speed. And the reason why is because you can use something called a hayden Preskill argument or protocol to recover the information in the complementary region unless you have access to this whole purple thing. So again, we said that the purple region can't be um, bigger than, you can't need more than VBT to recover the information, but could you get away with less? That's the question. So suppose you had significantly less than VBT of this spin chain, what would happen? Well, what you'd have is now in the complement, that is all the blue stuff minus the purple, you'd have something which is first of all, maximally entangled with the purple. And second of all, you'd have access to part of the scrambled output of this circuit. That is because the butterfly cone here sets the size of the scrambled region, you would have access to some of the scrambled bits because you don't have all of VBT inside your purple region. And this is exactly the situation that Hayden Preskill addresses. It says, if I have a system or I control more than half the system, which is what I do here. And if I have also some of the scrambled output of some scrambling operation, then I can recover the information that I injected originally using that maximal entanglement as a sort of helper. And so that's the situation here. If you have anything less than VBT in this purple region, then and from the complementary point of view, you have both maximal entanglement with purple, that's by assumption, because we started with F equals one, and you have access to some of the scrambled output because you're intentionally making your region smaller than VBT. And then arguing using Hayden Presto just immediately implies that the mutual information will be large with the complement, and so the complement can recover the information instead of the region itself. So, you know, this may be unfamiliar to many of you, and I, I won't have time to explain it in much more detail, but the, the basic point is just that when you have a quantum system, if you possess more than half of it and it's all scrambled up, then you always have the information. And if you possess less than half, you don't. So it's a really a question about figuring out when you have more or less than half of the relevant system. And that's the game we're playing here. And so the key point is that because you have all this entanglement to start with, as long as you have any amount of the scrambled output, you can recover the information provided you have access to all that entanglement. So then the reverse of that is if the purple region is at least bigger than VBT, bigger than or equal to VBT, it can recover the entanglement because the complement cannot. And since you have this upper and lower bounds, it means it has to just be the butterfly speed. Okay, so that's the case F equals one. 
Um, now, more generally, what happens is, is kind of an extension, we argue is an extension of Hayden Kreskel, where you should essentially think of starting with a state that's not maximally entangled. And so what you have to do is you have to first generate that resource of maximal entanglement, and then you can run Hayden Kreskel. So the reason why there is a minimum formula in that formula for VI is that there's two processes, that you need both the scrambled output and you need the maximal entanglement. And whichever one of those is the slower process is the rate limiting step, and that's why there's a minimum there. What we find empirically is that the entanglement generation is always the slowest process. There's even a sharp argument for that, which I'll allude to shortly. Um, and so that's why the VE, the entanglement growth rate, is what ultimately determines the information speed. So just to be totally clear, what, um, or to try to be as clear as possible, what I'm saying is what you would do now in the general case is you start from this under entangled state. You first generate enough entanglement between your candidate region and the rest of the world. And then you can use that entanglement to run the hayden Preskill argument and conclude about where the information can be and cannot be. So what this will have to do with is really about where entanglement is saturated or not saturated. So here's the precise argument. So let's assume that VE is less than VB times one minus F. Um, and we actually have an argument for this in the paper, which you can read in an appendix, um, which I, I think is, there's some non-trivial assumptions there, but I think it's reasonable. And we don't know of a counterexample. Um, and this implies that this operator spreading is not the rate limiting step except when f is equal to one. So we really just need to track the entanglement. So we need to ask when the entanglement is saturated. And so as I emphasized, what we need to track is the effective size of the system plus the memory plus the reference entanglement or plus the extra entanglement for Hayden Presco. So here's the key idea. Let's call A saturation the region whose entropy has just saturated. So for very big regions at some fixed time, the entropy is not yet saturated because they're not close to equilibrium. That, sorry, it was so big it wasn't inside the picture. So for very large regions, it's not saturated. For very small regions, it is. And so we can find the region at a given time, which is just saturated. And what I claim is that the effective size of the system plus memory is just twice the size of that region. Because you have that region, which now has saturated entanglement, and you have another region of equal size outside, which is maximally entangled with it. Here, by equal size, I mean equal size in an information theoretic sense. Obviously, the rest of the chain is some enormous size system. But by applying a unitary on that rest of the chain, you can distill it down into a size system equal to A sat, which is maximally entangled with A sat. So in other words, you can just think of all this extra stuff. It's not doing anything special for you because it's not really entangled. It's just entangled amongst itself. It's not entangled with the saturated region. So the effective size of the rest of the system is just also equal to the size of the saturated region. Thus, we say, because the operators have spread faster than VB, if the region A is bigger than A saturated, recovery is possible because that region definitely has, because it, let's say you can argue again by the complement, if you go to the complement of that region, it's not maximally entangled. It's like only a subset of the memory. And so you don't, you're not able to run Hayden Presco. And so it has to be in, in the region A. Whereas if the region A is less than the saturation region size, so it's entropy saturated a while ago, then, going to the complement, that region contains more than half the system because it contains some of a saturation in addition to the entire complement. And it contains some of the scrambled output. And so by Hayden Preskill, you can recover the information in the complement and hence not in the region A. And then you just define these speeds asymptotically by taking the limits of large size regions and long time to get away from finite size artifacts. And this absolutely defines the information speed, which just is obtained from essentially the time to saturate for a given size region. The information speed is just the region size divided by that saturation time. 
a simple calculation using the formula I postulated here tells you that this speed is then VE at that initial entanglement fraction divided by one minus F. So even if you didn't follow all the details of that, the important takeaway is just that there is a very precise point information argument, which just relies on assuming some form for entropies and assuming that things are sort of totally scrambled over scale VBT. With those two precise assumptions, you can make a precise argument that implies that the information velocity will be this particular thing. You can question those assumptions, but once you grant those assumptions, the argument is, is sharp. So let me tell you some of the evidence for this. Um, we, we first look at spin chain. So let's look at our favorite uh, transverse longitudinal field, mixed field Ising model. Um, you know, this is like, my chaos bread and butter, I guess, along with many other people. Um, so we have uh, Ising couplings. We have a uh, longitudinal field HZ and transverse field HX. I think here J is one in these simulations. HZ is like 0.5. HX is 1.05. It's fairly standard parameters. And what we do is we study 22 spins, so the Krilov method, standard stuff. And we literally do that protocol. So we take we have open boundary conditions, so we can just look at one side of it. And we take, say, the first spin, which we regard as the reference, and we entangle it with spin two. And then spin two through 22 are the dynamically evolving system. And we literally compute the mutual information. Since we have access to the whole wave function, we can do this. We just compute the mutual information. As I said, the mutual information goes between zero and two in this case. And so we define mutual information equals to one as kind of the midpoint which we just use as a, as a simple finite size estimator for where the information region boundary is. So if I is bigger than one, we say the information is in there. And if it's less than one, we say it's not in there. So we simply look at this um, mutual information as a function of time for different regions and different entanglement fractions, and we get a bunch of curves. If we didn't look at the level sets of these curves in space time, we look at the level set I equals one or i equals log two, if I include the log, that level set defines, the slope of that level set defines the information speed. So we just look at the points in space time where i is one, modulo some lattice regularization, et cetera. And we extract from that a slope, which is the information speed. And we can do this for different values of the entanglement fraction f by preparing initial states of the right form. And we get actually out some information speed. So this is like directly measuring the information speed from the definition. Then we can um, independently measure the entanglement velocity, V, and VB. So entanglement velocity we can get from um, just observing entanglement growth in, in the same kind of 22 spin chain. And VB we can get from a larger scale tensor network calculation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But and we can get these and they're all independent. Uh, what's plotted in black here on the right is the information speed extrapolated, extracted from the protocol I described on the left. What's plotted in blue is this ratio of VE and one minus over one minus F. And uh, you see at least at small F, they agree almost perfectly. At sort of more intermediate size F, they start to disagree a little bit, but here it's actually becoming numerically quite challenging because you're already fairly close to maximal entanglement. The system size is not very large. So it's actually hard to extract VE in a good way, for example. Um, in particular, VE is vanishing as you approach maximal entanglement. So you're starting to divide two small numbers, VE and one minus F. Um, and so it just gets sort of numerically unstable, I think, and it's not, you can't really trust it. But that's just a story, you know? So I think we can claim a good agreement at small f. Um, at larger f, we don't necessarily expect it to agree perfectly. It still agrees pretty well. Um, but there is some room to speculate that something else is going on, I suppose, although we, we don't think so. We think it's just a finite size effect. So just to emphasize, we have three numbers that we compute independently of each other. And we have a no parameter fit, which puts them all related to each other. And, and this actually works in this spin chain. Now, there's also uh, a very different kind of calculation that you can do, a different kind of bread and butter. 
um, which for some people is uh, more of a go-to than the Ising model. And that's a holographic conformal field theory. The reason why this is accessible is because you can compute entropies and hence mutual informations using the Ryu Takinagi formula, which is a formula that relates entanglement to geometry. And this calculation is sort of doable, you know, whereas calculating entanglement entropies in general is very hard, something we have to do numerically typically, or can only work perturbatively, or you know, only calculate ring entropies. Somehow for holographic systems, we believe we can calculate the entropy itself. And that's very interesting. So this is another nice class of models where you also have strong chaos, but which are very different than spin chains, but where we can do the calculation. And we can set up this general class of entangled states with the parameter f in a way which I described before, where we start from some kind of partially entangled state, which we think of as a thermofield double at some lower energy density, and then we just add energy locally. So in the bulk, this is described as like taking a sort of small wormhole and throwing in some shell of energy into it, which makes it kind of a, uh, makes the black hole bigger. So um, this is not a holography talk, so I'm not gonna really explain too much in detail what we're actually doing here, but just so you hear the words. Um, we have this thermofield double state, which is dual to a wormhole geometry with two black holes. We can add energy to it, which increases the energy and gives us an entanglement fraction f between zero and one. And uh, we can add entanglement by injecting a particle which is entangled with the reference. And then the question just becomes tracking sort of what regions um, on the boundary have access to this particle in the bulk and what regions don't. So there's a very beautiful story in ADS CFT having to do with what are called entanglement wedges and which are telling you about where information is located from the boundary point of view. And uh, anyways, we can follow this story and just compute. So we just need to find the smallest region on the boundary that always includes this infalling particle inside of its so-called entanglement wedge, which just means inside of the, in between the RT surface and the boundary, the Ryutaki Nagi surface. So this calculation you can do, um, we did it. it. Generalizes a calculation that Mizei and Stanford did, which was just for the F equals zero case. And um, here's an example of it. So. I'm not sure how helpful this will be to this crowd, but I'll just say it anyways. So you can start from, uh, we actually consider charged black holes, so black holes with mass and charge, because this lets you tune the ratio of VE and VB. Um, for simple holographic CFTs, VE and VB are both of the same order. So we wanted to have a situation where you could probe the difference between these two things over a wider range of scales. So that's how we added charge to this story. So you can start with the ground state. That's what this picture here, in the lower left indicates. This is called a Penrose diagram. It's just a picture of the space time where we've rescaled lengths and times to make it compact. So this is like ground state. Then this blue line here is the shell of charged energetic matter we've thrown in to make a black hole. Then the green line here is the particle we've thrown in, which carries the entanglement with the reference. And then at some later time, we can choose a region. I'm suppressing the spatial direction here you know, around, the, around the CFT. We can choose a region. And if the region's RT surface, which is ending at this other orange point, if that region includes the green thing, then that region has access to the entanglement. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. So you just need to do a geometrical calculation here. And uh, it turns out that you very directly see that this entanglement saturation time is precisely the thing which matters. Um, so, you know, if you, yeah, well, let me not go into that in, in more detail because I don't think it's gonna be too comprehensible. So, so anyways, you can see it, you can do the calculation. There's a couple here formulas for everything in terms of black hole parameters and so forth. But at the end of the day, you get exactly what I claimed. So in the red is VB, the orange is VE of F equals zero, the X axis is F, the Y axis is VE over one minus F. We can compute this thing analytically. We can compute numerically by directly finding the mutual information, what VI is, and they just uh, perfectly match each other over the whole range of F. And moreover, you see that this VE over one minus F actually just goes to VP at F equals one. So this model actually shows that in a nice way. 
So we can do the calculation and, and it just works. Okay, there's no fitting here. There's nothing. We just extract all of these things independently and they simply have to match. Okay, so what have I told you so far? Um, I defined a precise setting in which we can characterize the speed of information spreading. And I argue that in chaotic systems, there was a very universal formula for the information speed. In particular, in this quasi 1D setting, I, I gave you a result in terms of the speed of entanglement growth, which relates to like thermalization and the speed of operator spreading, which relates to uh, out of time order correlators and so forth. And I gave you this formula, which I kind of derived or at least sketched the derivation of from a purely quantum information argument. And then I showed you that it holds at least approximately in spin chains at high temperature and also holographic field theories at any temperature. So um, to us, that smelled like we were onto something pretty general. And we conjectured, I think, reasonably that this is going to hold for a very wide class of physical systems. As I mentioned, there's lots of extensions. I won't talk about those. Um, what I want to talk about now is some puzzles that remain. So there are some open questions that maybe you all can help us with, um, which I think are very interesting. And that's what we're going to turn to. So the question I want to ask is, let's consider, say, the case of f equals 1, the fully entangled state. So then it's just the butterfly velocity which matters. But uh, there's a, a question here, which is which butterfly velocity? This question arises because there's actually several different ways of defining out of time order correlators and commutators at finite temperature, which are inequivalent. So one of the most standard ones, at least which appears in the condensed matter literature, is to take the commutator here and square it, and then just trace that with the thermal state. So it's commutator squared, thermal state, trace. That corresponds in this formula to alpha equals, say, 0 or 1. That's what we call the unregulated commutator. Just, we have a quick question. Yeah, please. Is there a reason to think of information velocity as being constant, like we think of light velocity as constant? Constant as a function of what? Can I ask the questioner questions and then they can respond? <laughs> they can, but it's going to be very delayed, so it um, will not be a smooth conversation. I, I don't think, I mean, the information velocity depends on temperature, it depends on the initial entanglement fraction, it depends on several things. So I don't think it's constant in any absolute sense. Okay. It, it, it may be sort of like a state dependent speed of light. So if you sort of live in a universe where you have some background energy density that doesn't change too much, and if you can only have so much entanglement to start with, then it can kind of define an upper limit on how fast things can go. But it's not really constant with the parameters of the system. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, so, but um, at finite temperature where this density matrix is not trivial, so at infinite temperature, rho is just identity, so it doesn't matter where we put it. At finite temperature, when it's non-trivial, it matters how we distribute the factors of rho inside this trace. Um, you may ask why you'd ever consider such a thing. There are various reasons. One is that in a quantum field theory, it's nice to separate these points, each other in, in time. Here, you're separating them in imaginary time. This can get rid of some divergences that are annoying. Um, but maybe more physically, it just turns out that these actually measure different quantities. Whereas in earliest calculations, in conformal field theories and ADS-CFT, this choice of alpha did not matter too much. There is recent work from the last year or two, um, including by my colleagues at Maryland, Liao and Galitsky, and uh, the group of Conrad Scholm, where they found that there are models, at least in perturbation theory, where um, the commutator's dependence significantly on the choice of alpha. So for example, in particular, the speed at which the operator expands as measured by this object would depend on alpha. So in other words, there's not just one VB, there's a whole family of VBs. And to me, this raises a rather important question, which is given the story I just told you, which of these different alphas or, or some other object or whatever actually controls the information speed? Um, and we don't know the answer to that question. So I think this is a sharp open question that um, is timely and important and I, it would be lovely to see some progress on it. What I'll tell you about in the, in the very short remaining time I have is, is some progress with my students on trying to answer some 
more basic questions that we need to understand before we can tackle this more general problem. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now again is a spin chain, back to spin chains, um, because as I already said, holographic theories don't seem to have this dependence on alpha, so we need some other tool. And what we're going to use is a method that my postdoc Shang Long and I, who I mentioned before, um, developed a tensor network method, really a, a matrix product state method in 1D for calculating this operator dynamics. The basic idea is you represent the Heisenberg operator as a matrix product operator. And there, this, this picture on the right shows a picture of the entanglement of that operator as a function of space and time, space being where you cut it and time being how long you've evolved for. And this yellow region here is very highly entangled, the pink blue region, here, sorry, the purple blue region out here is very low entanglement. And our idea was as long as you're interested in physics sort of in the low entanglement region, maybe up to the front here, you can get away with a low bond dimension matrix product operator approximation. You're making a bad approximation in the interior, but because there's a light cone, you kind of expect that error won't propagate out to infect the physics outside too much. And so you might be able to reliably extract this sort of early time region, even at quite late time physics from a small bond dimension calculation. And that's what we found to be the case. So what um, my student really did in very nice work was to generalize this to finite temperature. Um, what you need to do is essentially distribute your thermal factors in, in a clever way so that you can get the, the out of time order correlator, the commutator by taking the norm of something. This doubles your precision in the computation. So it's nice to set it up this way. There was some previous work independent of us by Han and Hartnell, where they also generalized the method that Shenlong and I developed. So I'm going to give them credit for that. But they didn't use this norm trick. So this really helps you get a little bit more out of the method. Um, and anyways, you can do this calculation. And what you can produce are, are, are contours of constant commutator, either for the unregulated or, say, regulated case, by which we mean alpha equals 1 half. So we only study these two cases, alpha equals zero, which is equivalent to alpha equals one, and alpha equals one half. In general, you can study the whole spectrum and we think they're all different, but we focus on these two for simplicity. So these are just level sets. I don't mean for you to take anything in particular from these, except that they roughly grow linearly in time. So it looks like there's a velocity and there's actually two curves in each of these, um, a solid line and a dashed line, and they're more or less on top of each other. So the data is reasonably well converged um, even with a modest bond dimension of only 16. Now, 16 is not large from sort of standard MPS point of view, but here we're multiplying several layers of MPOs because we have the density matrix, then the actual operator that we're evolving the density matrix again, and we need to do this and then compute the norm of it. So it just takes a while. I'm not claiming this is the best you can possibly do, but it was a useful first step and we could get what we wanted to get out of it. And uh, I really credit Shubayan for doing this in a nice way. Um, so, so, so from this, we can get some physics. First of all, there was this proposed form, which I show in the upper right corner, a, uni a claimed universal form for the way these commutators should look ahead of the front. Um, there should be a kind of X minus T behavior, which is the ballistic behavior, but there can also be a broadening of the front as, as you go along in time. So that the link scale over which the front is varying can grow with time. And that's characterized by this T to the P in the denominator. This is a form that Shang Long and I first wrote down, and then I think shortly after us, more or less independently by Kamani, Hughes, and Nahum. Um, and anyways, what we find is that this form continues to fit well at finite temperature. So the broadening that we saw at finite temperature, at infinite temperature, survives to finite temperature. And moreover, we find that the velocities differed pretty dramatically between the regulated and unregulated case. So in the unregulated case, the velocity is almost constant as a function of beta. It barely changes. It seems determined by the high energy behavior. Whereas in the regulated case, the velocity is actually dependent significantly on beta. It starts normalized to one and then drops. By the time you get to beta equals two, it's maybe 80% of its initial value. So I mean, it's not a huge change, but it's, it's changing significantly over time, especially compared to the unregulated case. So what we conclude is that in this spin chain model, we've sort of verified in this non-perturbative large, large size setting that the previously observed perturbative calculations of alpha dependence are sort of correct, or at least, you know, 
that they're consistent with our results in this in this uh, non perturbative setting. Okay, so it seems like this alpha dependence is really there. And this may not mean much to you, but I guess there is, there's been some spirited debate, shall we say, in the community over whether this alpha dependence was really there or not. There are various arguments why it can't be there in various kinds of models. Um, so some people were skeptical, but it does seem like there is mounting evidence that it's present and something we have to deal with. Um, that's nice. Um, we, we really wanted to understand what happens at very low temperature as well. We couldn't access that in the spin chain. So, so Shubhan also, also did a nice field theory calculation. Or well, we studied um, Owen vector model. It doesn't have so much to do with the spin chain, except that they both have an energy gap at low temperature. And this model is accessible perturbatively. So we can actually access um, the OTOCs at large in, in, a, in a relatively straightforward way. So we consider this vector model here, Owen vector model. And the, the four point function, which defines the commutator, it has four operators in it. So it's a four point function, can be obtained from some kind of ladder sum, which I schematically show here. I won't tell you the details of the calculation. You're welcome to look at the paper. It's a known technique now, but we apply it in this new situation. Um, in particular, we looked in the paramagnetic phase where there's a mass gap and we looked at temperature is much less than that mass gap where you would expect a theory to be described by a essentially dilute gas of weakly interacting quasi particles. So essentially this should be a classical gas almost except for the short range quantum scattering. And we find indeed that the scattering rate is, is exponentially small in the gap over temperature, which is what you would expect, it's very dilute. And we can compute a butterfly speed, which is essentially proportional to the speed of sound, which I, I can kind of make sense. Sound speed is the characteristic speed of this nearly classical dilute gas. And we find that the butterfly speed is proportional to the sound speed. So the picture that emerges here is that this speed, which is dropping down towards zero, we would like to say, in the spin chain case, if, if we could go all the way down, we'd actually see that it approaches, say, square roots of T, which is like the sound speed of this dilute gas of spin excitations at low temperature. And we can directly see that in this field theory model. What we cannot see here is the alpha dependence or the broadening. Neither of those are present in this approximation. It's known that this um, kernel kind of formalism can never give you alpha dependence. And we actually verify that explicitly. So you need something more to see the regulator dependence here. But at least we could explore the speed dependence as you go to low temperature. OK, and so that's kind of where we are right now. We, we did some nice calculations. I think we sort of established the behavior at finite temperature in terms of the broadening and the alpha dependence, et cetera, um, for for the spin chain model, we could really probe low temperature in the field theory model. And we're starting to assemble the tools that I think will be needed to address this question that I posed of what ultimately is setting the information speed at finite temperature. You know, is it is it the alpha equals a half case, which seems to be more physical in the sense that it knows about only the low energy physics? Or is it the unregulated case, which somehow knows about the high energy physics? Or is it some other object altogether? It's not clear. Okay, so that, let me let me summarize. Um, the story I told you is that, as we know very well, information can move coherently, but it can also spread chaotically in a way which it's still moving and still spreading, but not accessible to local probes. That's sort of the one essence of scrambling. And in this form, it, it obeys various kinds of speed limits. So there's some kind of speed of information spreading. Um, and I tried to convince you that we're sort of building a set of concepts and tools that help us understand and calculate this spreading. And in particular, I presented you a quantum information argument and a set of calculations and a diverse set of models which confirm or support the universal picture that we've been conjecturing. Um, there's lots of interesting physics. I didn't talk about this at all, but you know, you can look in disordered models or quasi-periodic models where you can see slowing down of the spreading as you approach localization, et cetera. Um, there's lots of interesting directions to think about. And then in the final part, I told you that motivated by the question of, you know, how to extend this information spreading result to the most general setting at finite temperature, we wanted to know sort of which butterfly speed was relevant, but that was part of the question. And um, 
So we started investigating now in, in some detail the properties of OTOCs at finite temperature and like spin chains and field theories to really try to get a handle of this finite temperature behavior. Okay, and that's where we're at right now. So thank you a lot for, for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. So let's see if there's any questions. So actually, I have a question myself, maybe Please. to start with. So if you've looked at spin chain models and field theories, could you also do these calculations and for example, um, also local models where you use unitary gates instead of an active local Hamiltonian and maybe use random gates and to see what happens? Yeah, you definitely can. And in fact, that's something people have done. Uh, somehow I didn't, I must have removed that slide, but yeah, this is something people have done a lot of. Um, um, yeah, in fact, this broadening form here, where, when you have P equals to one, which is what we've argued is like the universal behavior, um, that was seen first in these random circuits. And then Shang Long and I gave an argument. We, so we, we made up a new model, which can interpolate between the P equals zero and P equals one cases. Again, there's kind of a backstory here, which I glossed over, which is that in all these holographic calculations, you always got P equals zero, which was like a sharp front. And in all the random circuit calculations, you always got P equals one, which was like a diffusive front. So the, there was a question of which one was the physically universal one. And you know, maybe the P equals zero was a large N artifact. And so we were able to, to argue that um, in another one of these random circuit models. But so okay. far, what you don't have is a model like that at finite temperature because the random circuit always adds energy. So what we really need is some kind of really controlled, calculable finite temperature model where you can see, say, the broadening and the dependence on alpha. We just don't have that yet. ADS CFT okay. gives you a nice model, but it doesn't have these features. At least they're hard to unearth there. So we're still missing a good tractable analytical model. Okay, thanks. You've got uh, one more question. Also, thanking you for the nice talk. Thanks. So scrambling can be also detected in integrable spin chains for specific initial state preparations. Does your result on velocity of information apply in such cases? Because they're assuming that quantum chaos wasn't used in the proof there. Ah, um, uh, I would say it in general does not apply. What, it, what we're really, we, we did use quantum chaos in the argument that, for example, in the Hayden Prescott argument, saying that, you know, for example, here's a way that chaos arises. If you could, suppose this was just exactly VBT in, in radius here. If you, gave a few sites at the edge to the complement, then the complement could recover the information. But if you also just gave a few sites in the center, the complement can still recover the information. So it's totally spread out in a uniform, delocalized way over the whole region. And it doesn't actually matter which part of the purple thing you give to the complement, you always give it the information. In integrable cases, that may not always be true. So maybe the information is more localized somewhere in this in this region, you know, maybe not. I'm not, not all integral systems are the same, certainly. So for free particles, what I'm saying is true. For Heisenberg chain, I'm less sure like what happens. I don't know, you know, a nice description of that. So we, we did use chaos in the argument in sort of arguing that it's universal, it doesn't depend on the state, et cetera, too much, except for this entanglement fraction. And so for that reason, you know, while it may be the case that some special states and integrable systems have similar kind of behavior, I, I, I don't think I could claim that it's some generic thing or that our argument applies to it in general or that it has to obey our argument. Okay, thanks. We've got some more questions. So first of all, in the context of a many body fermionic system, is there some connection between the butterfly velocity and the velocity of zero or first sound propagation? Uh, good question. Um, this has not been looked at in detail as far as I know, um, but you know, we would expect them to be sort of of the same order typically, but they can presumably depend on Landau parameters in different ways, for example. So I don't think there is a full, I'm not aware of a full calculation of this, of this thing. Um, but let's see, do I, what, what more can I say? I mean, as we saw here, 
Um, this was like this really the speed of first sound, basically. I mean, it's not a Fermi gas, but but uh, but um, it was the speed of first sound which was coming in. And you know, maybe you could arrange for zero sound and first sound to be very different by tuning your Landau parameters. And then I'm not sure which of those two would be closer to the butterfly speed or you know, or whatever. I'll, I'll mention a puzzle here actually. So there is a kind of question about whether say the butterfly speed has to always be faster than the speed of sound or any speed of sound, any kind of long live excitation. Because if it's a speed limit, surely it has to be faster than all the speeds, right? That doesn't make sense. On the other hand, I don't think of sound as propagating quantum information. It could certainly propagate classical information, but, but not quantum information, I think. So I think there's, a, there's a, also a question here which we don't fully understand yet, which is say, you know, if you took a system with a very slow butterfly speed and you coupled it to a system with a very high sound speed, um, what would be the butterfly speed of that combined thing? Would it be the sound speed essentially, or would it still be the original butterfly speed? And the sound speed is just some kind of like classical information propagating on top of that. I think we don't fully understand these kind of questions yet. So I think that's a good, actually a good question to ask, try to calculate. It also ties nicely to the next question that's being asked. Would you say that the chaos in 1D quantum systems would be similar to chaos in 2D classical systems? You're thinking quantum to classical mapping, I guess. Um, no, I, I, I don't see why that would be the case. I mean, Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think so because, well, there, there are various reasons, but yeah, what, what can I say? Well, I, I don't think, it, I don't think it's, I don't think it would be the case. Um, in particular, like the generic kind of chaotic quantum system doesn't have a nice classical mapping, even in the, you know, the quantum classical mapping is not actually giving you a classical system at the end even in equilibrium, because there's phases in the path integral. So if, if I'm interpreting the questioner's context correctly, I would say even at the equilibrium level, it's not really a classical model. So there's no reason why I would expect out of equilibrium, it would be more classic. OK, thanks. And there's a few more people thanking you for the nice talk. And I think we're running out of time. So let's make that the last question. Great. So, Thanks again for giving a nice talk. And next week, we'll have Sylvia Papalardi talking about entanglement dynamics and chaos in systems with collective and long range interactions. So for people who want updates on the talks, please just follow the link in the description of this video, and you'll be able to join the Google group and get updates. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah.